Thank you to those who have led us in worship. I tell you, there is no greater joy uh, than preaching uh, with a wet shirt cuff. Uh, and there is also nothing that strikes fear in the preacher's heart like our passage this morning. Uh, so let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we have life, that we are called children of God, that we can gather as your church. We say thank you. We pray that in this moment of reading and preaching of your word, that we would hear your voice that you would speak to us, that you would build us up through your holy word, that we would obey it, that your, your spirit would lead us to truth, that we would be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. I pray as the one with the task of preaching that I would be faithful to your word and your word alone, that your word would be planted in our hearts that your word would be preached, obeyed, and lived out to the fullest. We pray these things in the name of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus healed the multitudes without medicine, and he never asked for insurance or a copay. Uh, Jesus was not a licensed counselor, but he has healed broken hearts for 2,000 years. Jesus never wrote a book, yet his life has inspired more books than can be held in the world's libraries. Jesus never wrote a song, yet he's furnished the theme to more songs than the world's songwriters combined. Jesus never founded a college, but he has more students than the world's colleges combined. Herod couldn't kill him. Satan couldn't seduce him. His enemies couldn't destroy him. And the grave couldn't hold him. On the third day, he rose from the dead to provide you with victory over sin and death. With all of that said, I merely want to talk about how Jesus impacts your relationships. I don't think I'm asking too much for us to open our ear and as hard as it may be, I don't think I'm asking too much for us to obey what he tells us. If you join me in Ephesians chapter 5, we'll pick it up at verse 21. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. If you've got that open, can I hear a big loud amen? Amen. Thank you. I'm a bit nervous about reading this passage. If you're a bit nervous about hearing it, can I hear an amen? <laughs> Giggles are all right. I'll take that. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, and that's no accident. Uh, 21, depending on the Bible you have in front of you, may be a strange way to start this passage, but you'll see why we start there in a moment. Ephesians 5, 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. 
For the husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However... Each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Moving into chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Into verse 5. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor with their when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one of you whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them since you know that He who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. There's a lot there, but last week we began a a short three-week series titled Home Improvement, The Gospel Around the Kitchen Table. And if we're going to be fair, if we're going to preach a series on faith at home, we have to deal with the passages that speak of the home. And there is so much to be discussed in this passage. My time is short, so my points will be few. But to begin, we need to lift up this idea that Christians should place Christ at the center of all relationships. That Christians should place Christ at the center of all relationships. We, we just read a passage that, that speaks of the household. But, but if you really look at it, it is speaking to how Christ should be the center of each and every relationship. We read this passage and and we typically focus on the wife and husband dynamic and we will do that for a moment this morning. But when you read this passage, we see clearly that this is speaking of all relationships. As Christians, we should put Christ at the center of all relationships. That's a word to moms and dads and husbands and wives, grandparents, singles, 
divorcees. That's, that's a word to widows and widowers. If, if we confess Jesus as Lord, then we should seek to honor Him. Amen? And we should seek to honor Him by loving Him and loving others. But Christ should transform everything. We, we should reflect Christ and, and how we think and how we speak and how we act. The, the transformation that Christ brings changes everything. That should be true for us uh, as Christians and as Christ is in the center of our relationship. That, that means that we should treat our family, our, our neighbor, our friends, uh, our enemies, our mail carrier, our, our restaurant server. We, we should treat everyone in a way that honors Christ. And that may be hard for us to see in this passage, but it's there. The, the Apostle Paul actually goes through how a relationship with Jesus Christ transforms the household. And he speaks in the context of the first century Greco-Roman world. And he speaks of wives and husbands and children. And then the passage even discusses the, the difficult issue of of slavery, and I'll, I'll be completely transparent with you this week. Uh, uh, there was many moments when I just wanted to stop and only read through the end of chapter five. There, there's so much going on there. Why make it harder on myself? I said, well, why not just stop short of reading the, the slave master verses? But, but I decided to go ahead with it, uh, partially because we had already printed it in the bulletin, and I'm just a perfectionist. <laughs> like that. Um, I would hate for the, the bulletin to be wrong on my part. Uh, all kidding aside, I, I, I decided to go forward with it because I wanted to be intellectually honest. But if we're going to take this serious, we need to take all of it serious. I want to be intellectually honest, but then I also want you to see that if, if we look hard enough and if we look deep enough, we, we can see how this passage speaks of the transformation that Christ brings. Apostle Paul is, is speaking into a world where slavery was a well-established institution. And, and hard, as hard as that is for us to think about, we, we do need to empty our, our brains of, of American slavery. It was something different, but still slavery nonetheless. I mean, but the Apostle Paul is speaking to a world where slavery was a well-established institution. I, I despise slavery. I, I believe God despises slavery, but the, the Apostle Paul, speaking into a world where it was a reality, tries to look at it, and as hard as it may be to see, to infuse it with Christ. And this passage doesn't condone slavery, and it, it doesn't abolish slavery either, but I, I do think it tries to look at it through the lens of Christ. I think this passage, as hard as it may be at some point, shows that Christ can transform even the ugliest of relationships. And perhaps that's the word for us this morning. Christ is at the center of all relationships. You're still with me. Can I hear an amen? amen. Um, so once we get that, 
Once we're standing on that foundation that Christians should place Christ at the center of all relationships, we need to see that out of reverence for Christ, your translation may have the, the fear of Christ, but the reverence to Christ leads to submission within relationships. Reverence to Christ leads to submission within relationships. I had us begin reading at verse 21, and I'm of the belief that Ephesians 5.21 may be one of the most neglected verses in our Bible. When, when we speak of faith at home, when, when we speak of relationships, when, when, even when we're speaking on submission, we have this tendency to dive right into verse 22 where we discuss wives submitting to husbands. I think we need to take serious, uh, we need to take verse 21 seriously, that we're to submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. Before we even discuss the family, the passage begins on a note. It makes a statement about submission in general. We're to submit to one another. Now, this gets difficult because outside of Christ, outside of Christianity, outside of the church, submission is about control. It's about power. It's about domination. That's the world's view of submission. The world would preach power and control and domination. But Christ says something completely different. Inside of Christ, inside of Christianity, inside of the church, submission means humility. It means service. It means love. And we see this in Jesus Christ. Christ. Let me remind you that Jesus left the splendor and glory of heaven and he took on flesh and blood and he moved into the neighborhood. And then he, he walked dusty roads in order for him to encounter broken people. And, and as he encountered broken people, he, he healed broken hearts. And, and broken bodies. He, he gave hope to the hopeless. He showed the way of eternal life to people dead in sin. <laughs> and then when he faced opposition and ridicule and insult and mockery, our scripture tells us he, he didn't retaliate and, and he made no threats in return. When, when he faced something more than that, when he faced whips and a crown of thorns and crucifixion, what did he do? <laughs> he laid down his life. And he bore our sins on the cross so that we might live. Submission inside of Christianity looks like humility and service and love. Out of reverence for Christ, we should submit to one another. That's a word for everybody here. Amen? But then the passage does get specific, and it shows us that marriage relationships thrive upon mutual submission. Marriage relationships thrive upon mutual submission. We've already seen that out of reverence for Christ, 
There's submission within relationships. That holds especially true. Right? If, that, if that's true for relationships in general, that holds especially true for the marriage relationship. Inside of this passage, the Apostle Paul quotes Genesis 2.24, this idea that a man and a woman should leave their father and they should come together and become one flesh. That two people with different backgrounds, different family dynamics, different everything should leave and become one flesh. At at the core of marriage is not physical attraction. At the core of marriage is not cohabitation. At the core of marriage is not shared bank accounts. At the core of marriage is It's something spiritual. At at the core of marriage is God who ordained marriage. At at the core of marriage is, is this biblical notion that two people created by God and in the image of God should become one flesh. For that to happen, there's going to be a great deal of submission. For, for that to happen, there's going to be an abundance of submission. Now, reading verses 22 through 24 can cause a great deal of reactions. Let's just remind ourselves what it says. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now, that can get many different reactions. Some, might, some wives might read that and in an honest moment go, well, have you met my husband? And that might be followed up with, why in the world would I submit to him? And some of you might hear that, read that, and say, well, we've never done that before. Why should we start now? Now my my sleeve is wet and so are my armpits. We've never done that before. Why should we start now? Someone might hear me and and at least lean in and ask the question, well, what does it mean to submit? Well, someone might ask, well, why does the, the husband get to lead? And then some others might read this and go, what in the world does Christ and the church have to do with my marriage? Okay, I I think if we keep reading verses 25 and following provide an answer to those questions and provide a large serving of humble pie to any husband who stuck his chest out as we read 22, 23, and 24. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Let's read that again. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. And in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. 
he who loves his wife loves himself. Why would a wife submit to her husband? Well, because a husband is to love his wife like Christ loved the church. Now, now remind me how much Christ loved the church. Oh, that's right. He loved the church so much that, that he left heaven. He left the glory and splendor of heaven and he walked on earth and lived a sinless life, yet he died for the church. And he died so that the church may be presented as radiant, without stain or wrinkle, blameless. Christ loved the church so much that he laid down his life. Christ loves the church so much that he gave away things that he could have held on to. Christ loved the church so much that he displayed humility and service and love when he could have done otherwise. Christ loved the so the church so much he gave his life. Husbands, love your wife that much. Husbands in the room, love your wives that much. And for that to take place, there's going to be an abundance of submission. Did we survive that? Can I still get an amen? Uh, I've got to, to bring this to a close. But finally, we, we've seen how Christ is transforming all these relationships. And then we finally need to say God's glory, not self-glory, is the goal. God's glory, not self-glory, is the goal. I, I believe that our resistance to submission comes from inflated ego and protruding pride. And our sin nature wants power and control and domination. So we resist this idea of submission because it hurts our ego. It damages our pride. Our sin nature seeks fame and spotlight and glory. But as followers of Jesus Christ, we're not seeking our own glory. Amen. Or if you have been seeking your own glory, stop. Inside of your own relationships, if you've been seeking your own glory out of faithfulness to Jesus Christ, stop. It's not about our glory. It's not about self-glory. We live in relationship with one another to give glory to God. Amen. We live in relationship with one another to give glory to the God who loved you so much that though he committed no sin of his own, he went to the cross for your sin, giving you the opportunity to experience abundant life here and now and eternal life in a day to come. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I pray as the pastor of this church, as, as the one that just 
read your word and preached your word, I, I pray that you would make use of what we've just experienced here. That, that your word would penetrate our hearts and minds and that your word would do its work. And Father, I pray that as a result, your church would be built up. That we would look more like Christ tomorrow than we do at this moment. Give us the courage to change priorities. Give us the willingness to break habits. May we live in faithfulness to you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.